some of you, you pastors, you know, you'll understand this. Some of you that are older, especially, you know, when you read history, you 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 find these great preachers, and almost all the great preachers had great trials. You know, they had a catastrophe, they had a trauma, they lost, and as I've gone through life, you know, I'm not saying I haven't had tough times, but there was times that I would say to myself, you know what, I, I'm kind of happy, I'm just coasting through, everything's going well, God's blessing, we're moving forward, things are happening in the church, but there's that inward part of me that says, When I stand before God, will I ever have been tested? Because I believe that when God says, well done, he never lies. So if he's going to tell me, well done, that means I have to do well. But at the same time, as human beings, there's this inner turmoil saying, okay, God, I'll just let me cruise. I've been a pastor for 35 years. I'm 64 years old. I've had a good church. God's blessed. We've gone through COVID, and and actually we've seen some really great things going on. Just let me coast until it's over. You do y'all do y'all understand what I'm saying? There's that I want to do something great, but I don't want to do something too great. I want I want to hear well done, but I. You know, the easy way out. Are, are we not all that way? Yeah. And this year we, we've been going through, uh, starting early on, uh, a study that I, I've called From the Shepherd King to the King of Kings in our church. Uh, and we look, what, what we did is we started at Genesis and we're right now in Matthew with the King of Kings. But in the process we looked at the godly king's of David, because God had promised that out of David's family there was going to come a great king, and there was eight godly kings, and we looked at why each one of them um, did great, but why they weren't the Messiah. And there was one that caught my attention, and I, I've talked about it, and He's God has brought it to my mind, and constantly. And um, now I think I know why. It's the story of Asa from Second Chronicles chapter 14 through 16. If you want to turn there, we'll look at verse 16, chapter 16 in a few minutes. I'm not going to read four, three chapters. You're welcome. <laughs> Let me tell you the story very quickly. I love stories. Let me just tell you the story of Asa. He's the first godly king, the third king of Judah. After Rehoboam, Abijah, then came, comes Asa. And Asa's a godly king. The first one that God says, he's a godly man. He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. And as you read the story, you find on out that there comes a time when the Ethiopians come with a thousand thousand soldiers. That's a million soldiers. That's a whole lot of army for any any army, even including today. And he comes against uh, Jerobo, I mean Asa, and Asa calls out to God, and he says, in ver- chapter 14, verse 11, he says, um, and of course my eyes are bad, I don't have my glasses, he <laughs> says, um, cried unto the Lord and said, Lord, it is nothing for thee to help, whether with many or with, um, with many, or, or with them that have no power. And he calls on God, and with his small army, he wins this incredible battle. And, 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 and he's, he's got this foundation for his ministry. In the next chapter, a prophet comes to him and says, you're doing well. If you will seek God, God will bless you. And Asa takes heart with that and says he's going to do what's right. He 
wipes out the, the idolaters and, and destroys this thing and takes care of that thing. And God blesses him. And the Bible says he has rest. He relied, now he has rest. By the way, that was what God had promised all the way back in Deuteronomy for the people of Israel. Blessings if they kept on trusting him. And the Bible says that he had peace for 35 years. I didn't catch this until today. And I, I don't take it that I'm, I'm taking too much out of this, but this is my 35th year as being pastor. And the Bible says in chapter 16 that the northern kingdom, Israel, decides that they're going to come. Basha is the king by this time. Jeroboam's dead. Basha comes on down. The, the city of Jerusalem was in the northernmost part of, the, of Judah, real close to the border. And so Basha comes on down to Ramah, which is just on the other side of the border. And he's going to build fortifications. What he's going to do is he's going to keep it so that people traveling from the north, from uh, Asia Minor and from all, the, they would come through that. You know what he's going to do? He's going to bottleneck it. He's going to keep it from being able to, to get to Jerusalem. He's going to starve them on out. It's going to be a fortification that's going to cause problems. And so Asa starts thinking. That was his first problem. And he says, I know what to do. He, he, sends, he takes the... He takes the gold and silver out of the temple. Boy, doesn't that warn you about something's wrong? Mm -hmm. He takes what's been dedicated to God and he gives it to a pagan. The king of Syria and says, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to break off your treaty with Israel. Cause problems. And the king of, of Syria listens to him and does exactly that. He goes in and he starts causing fights and, and, and war and guerrilla tactics. And so what Basha has to do is take everybody that was building this fortification, Rama, and move them back up north to fight against Syria. While he's up there, what happens with Asa is he takes his army, goes over the border, and takes all of the stonework, all the woodwork, all the stuff, and brings it back and builds a fortification on his side. In other words, it he won. He was smart. He succeeded. And of course, if it works, it's right, correct? <laughs> Until God shows up. And God says to him this. He, sa he says to him in, in chapter 16, I'm going to cheat. That, that light's good, and I appreciate the boys putting it on up there, but I'm going to. And it says in chapter 16, that's after 15, right? Right. Uh, chapter 16. Oh, that's, sorry. Be patient. He says, he says that that, that happened. And then he, he sends out a, a, a prophet and says, Because thou hast relied, earlier he was relying on the Lord. He says, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord God, therefore the hosts of the king of Syria escaped out of thy hand. And then he says this, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubans a huge host and a very great, uh, very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered thee, in, them into thine hand. Now, we're going to get to the next verse in just a minute, but what he's saying is this. Asa, I taught you something back 35 years ago, or many years ago. That event should have prepared you for this next event. You should have, because of this, Done, done things differently here. And then he goes on and he says this in chapter verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong 
in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Wherein thou hast done foolishly, henceforth, uh, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Now, what happened with Asa? Asa should have known better. Here's one reason why he's not wasn't the Messiah. And if you pay attention to most of the godly kings, almost all of them, with maybe with the exception of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah messed up, but he learned he repented. Almost all of them at the end of their ministry messed up. One of the great fears I've had in my life uh, is I want to finish well. I, I want I want to do. You know, I, I I'm I'm not fooling myself. I'm this is not midlife. I'm at the I'm on the other side of the hill going, not hopefully down, but I'm I'm. But I I want to finish well. For my church, for my kids, for my grandkids, for my fellowship that I'm part of, for other brothers and sisters. Uh, for other pastors. And Asa didn't learn. And what I, I think I've learned from this, among other things, is this. Whether you like it or not, all the mess that you've been in before was just pre preparation for the next mess you're going to be in. Because there's another mess coming down the road. In my question, the question is, is how are we going to handle it? How are we going to handle it? In the middle of all that's gone on with us, Asa's been the story that keeps coming to my head. Pete, you've gone through some minor things before. I've proven myself faithful. Will you trust me now? Uh, most of you, most of you know, and and, and uh, when the flood came, uh, uh, it's funny. Reggie wasn't there. Kathy was asleep. <laughs> I, I I love it. I she got to sleep through the whole thing, and she was safe. She was not in danger. Uh, on the other on the other side of the story, we were with our three grandchildren, and we rode it out in the middle of our house. Um, we lost our little church. Most of you have been to that church. Yep. It's no longer there. Uh, it, it, literally, the only thing that was there the next morning was the steps. <laughs> and that's the only reason they were there is underneath the wooden steps was a cement steps that we had tied it to. <laughs> and so it had a good foundation. Everything else is across the river on, the other, on somebody else's property right now. Um, our house had a 16 inches of water and uh, the church had three and a half feet. Uh, in the middle of that, uh, one of the neat things that we saw was God answering prayers right in the middle of it. Our grandchildren were sitting on a table and we were afraid. And I'm not trying to be afraid because Papa's got to be strong. <laughs> and we prayed, and my granddaughter prayed. <laughs> and almost immediately we started hearing water going down the vent like a bathtub. <laughs> and the water came out of the house in probably within 15 minutes. Wow. Now it stayed just below the thing, below the, the floor. It didn't go down much, and I'm convinced that what happened was the, the little church collapsed at that time. And that was the best thing that could have happened to us. Yeah. And the first thing my granddaughter wanted was to thank Jesus. <laughs> Amen. 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 This is good. But you see, you know, we look, we look at it, you know, he's talking about how he's afraid of doing stuff. Didn't want to do stuff, did stuff. 
There are some we we have prayed for over ten years about building a building at our church that was better than the little church. Most of you have been there. It's adequate, but let's face it, it it was beyond its prime. And we thought of different things, and we thought, well, we could take down that church, but boy, the problems that's going to cause. You know, you you remove an idol from the community. I'm sorry, you didn't hear that. (laughs) Our church, but seriously, the Little Brown Church. Everybody talked about the Little Brown Church. Well, you know what? I don't have to worry about the Little Brown Church anymore. Uh, Hilda and I have been talking about the fact that we're getting old, or at least she is. Uh, I mean, uh, Reggie, you and I, are, we, we're in trouble tonight. Yeah. Actually, you're probably in better shape now that I just pulled that one. But we're seriously, we've talked about what's going to happen when we retire. Because we we don't have a a house. Well, from this, God has worked. The parsonage is now going to be our Sunday school for at least a year. Um, yesterday, we made an agreement. We haven't signed papers yet, but we've got a piece of property. And I hope maybe by Christmas time, I'm going to be able to share some other things that God has done to meet our needs, to provide. Um, And so, as, as I had a pastor mention, this is probably the worst thing that's happened to you, and it is. This is the biggest tragedy we've ever had. We, I still can't imagine how much stuff we're keep throwing out of a house. We keep throwing stuff out. Keep throwing stuff out. Uh, but you know what? I can see that it's going to be the best thing. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to us. But I can see it's the best thing that's ever happened to us. I wish... I, I, if there's any way I could have avoided it, I would. But I also wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, right now we're living in a little camper. We still love each other. Although after tonight. <laughs> uh, but we're living in a little camper right next to the church. This has been tough. I'm physically drained. as I know Reggie is. I mean, I'm not... I don't know who it was that I was talking to about a person that called at four in the morning. That's the, that's the one. Anyways, still. Anyways, um, we're we're drained, we're tired, but God has been gracious. And I have, hopefully, hopefully when this is said and done, um, the Lord will say. The eyes of the Lord been searching. And Pete, how you handled this was how I wanted you to. It wasn't perfect. It definitely wasn't pretty. But it was what and how I wanted you to do it. And out of this, your church and your church people are stronger. I, I, I am thankful that it's getting to the place that the people don't come to church and look at me with those sad eyes. You know, because they know I'm tired, they know I'm worn out, they know we, you know, it, but they're, part of that is when they looked at me, they saw me be, you know, and so they just look at you like you look <laughs> bad. <laughs> so, God is gracious. So, very quickly, with that being said, I, I wanted to just share, and that's going to be quick. Reg, you said that too, didn't you? It's going to be quick. Six things very quickly I want to share with you that I have learned, and there's so much more. First of all, the power of things. Idolatry. None of us would say we're idolaters until 
what you own is being thrown away. Um, mine isn't quite so dramatic. I had se I've used the same Bible type since '76. I had almost all of them either in a sh in a file cabinet or on my desk. I use them all the time. They're some of them I use for my study Bible. This one was on the top of them all. If you look at it, about half of it has gotten wet. And uh, they stopped making this one. But God has graciously allowed me to find one. Um, and I'm going to be able to... But things. Yeah. I didn't realize how tied I was to things. Boy, I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. But things... things we, and, it's, and I know we have to have things, but I might have to have things, but the things don't have to have me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second of all, the blessing of friendship. People called, many of you called, you've come by, you showed up. I had a Pentecostal man preacher come to us this last week. And he just gave me a little bit of money. And he looked at me and said, when I was going through a tough time, he says, you were the only one that was there for me. Wow. And I don't know what it was. I mean, he's, he's not within our ilk, so to speak. I broke down and just bawled <laughs> and bawled. Involved. He was just there. But many of you have. And I appreciate it. And if I have not expressed my gratitude, please, I am so grateful. Hilda is so grateful. Uh, not just to this fellowship. The ACC that we're part of. I've had a number of them reach out, talk to me. Uh, been very gracious. We've had strangers, people that I didn't even know, show on up. Um... A church that my son was part of in South Carolina. By Thursday, it happened Thursday morning, Thursday night. They said we'll be there Saturday. Wow. And by the time they left on Sunday, everything four foot down in our church was tore out, wow. including taking chainsaws to the pulpit pews, not the pulpit pews, and ripping out the carpet in in about three inches of mud. They just got her done. There was a lady there. Two ladies came with them. They said, what can I do? One thing I... I don't know if I was proudest of or whatever, but I love my library. I lost about 85% of my books. And I says, would you go in there and throw them away? I just can't do it. That lady's been back two more times. Been so sweet. In the midst of that, we found out October she lost her husband to COVID. And yet she was reaching out to us in, her, in our hurt. The power of friends. If there's not, hopefully, I'm going to be a better friend. I know. That reaching out is important. I just didn't know how much it was important. And I really appreciate that. The provision of God, the third thing. When this happened, I laid in bed thinking, it's over. Just let me die, God. And I said, there's no way that we can afford We don't have insurance. You can't get insurance. You guys know that. How are we going to do it? God started giving us a vision of what we could do, like the parsonage and all that. Right now, the church today was pretty much, not entirely, but almost entirely painted. It's had drywall, mudded, painted. Going to have a platform put in this weekend. Sixty people are coming. I'll be I'll be honest with you. I don't want sixty people. You know that's a lot of people, but they're coming. 
Um, we've got carpeting coming. If we have to pay a little bit, it's going to be just minor. Um, the thing is, is when it's all said and done, our, our needs have been met for that. When this is over, unless something strange happens, we will not be in debt for any of that. People just reaching on out, blessing me. I would have never dreamed that. Uh, FEMA has been this much of a help. SBA, this much of a help. But churches and individuals have provided. And, and, and I'm here to tell you, it's just in a lot, the day that day that the house flooded, the first thing I thought is we got to get a hold of a hotel for tonight. My grandchildren could not get back to their home because of the flooding. Uh, their dad was on our side of the flood, but their mom was on the other side of the house. No hotel rooms. I didn't know what to do. One of our church members called up and says, we got a trailer, a little camper. That's where we're still at. Now, no, it's not the Taj Mahal, but I'm clean, I'm taken care of, and I know when I wake up in the morning, I'm still, uh, still safe and well. And so God has provided, we've written down some of those things. We have, to be honest with you, I would there's so much I've forgotten. But God has been very gracious. You see, the only way I would have understood how good much God will provide is if I got to a point that I needed Him more than I could, beyond what I could do. I'm there right now. Yeah. I can't handle it. Yeah. But unto Him that's able to do exceedingly, Amen. abundantly, Amen. above all that we could ask or think. Yes. I couldn't see anything. I still can't see the end of some of this stuff. I'm here to tell you, it's been an, it's it's been an amazing adventure. I it's still tough, but God has been providing. The fourth thing, the fallenness of this world. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. You know, Brother Reggie was talking about a few years ago them having a tornado basically ended up having rain in his place he's able to minister but it wasn't God never intended for us to have this mess whether it's a flood or tornadoes or whatever one of the things that bothers me most as a pastor is that I I'm just not able to help the people that I want to I go up and down the creek and it's tore up I've got Four people in our church that are going through things, and I can't help them because I'm trying to put together a church and get a place for us to live. I mean, but it, but God understands that, and but it also makes me realize this isn't my final home. This is not what it's all about. Two more things, and I'm done. The preciousness of the Psalms. He just mentioned it. By the way, uh, I don't know if he, pur I have a feeling he purposely did that today. I've told him many times that that psalm, It's Not Well With My Soul, is one of my favorite ones that he's done. So, uh, But yeah, the psalms have meant a lot to me. Uh, uh, my daughter, um, there's an author named Ortland, O R T L U I D, that wrote um, something in lowly. What is it? Gentle and Lowly. It's a great book if you ever get it. He's also just recently done a devotional on the Psalms. It just, it's not deep. It's just the Psalm and then one page of comments on it. But the Lamentations have really been... I understand them all. I knew about it beforehand, but now I can, now I can pray them. I wish I didn't have to, but I can. And they are precious to me. And then the last one, the need of my father. <sighs> Let's face it, we go through this whole life pretty much on cruise control. We pray 
because we know we have to. And, and I'll be honest with you, I think most preachers will have to admit the area that they probably are weakest in is their prayer life. And I've prayed many times, Lord, I want my prayer life to be better. And then He brings me into this so that it will be. He answered my prayer, but not the way I expected. But it makes me realize I really need my Father. And uh, I can I can, and should come boldly to the throne of grace. I don't know how this is going to end, but I do want to, when it's all said and done, me not to be Asa. I wish and pray that what I learn will be a blessing and encouragement to you all and, and my church and others.